Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alex Lloyd Hunter. I'm one of the executive directors of Forward Action, and I'm going to be talking today about fundraising with digital movements. So, we're going to go through what we mean by a movement, some examples who are, of organisations who are using this approach really effectively for their digital fundraising, and finally, the strategies and tactics you need to um, do fundraising with a digital movement at your own organisation. So, just to give you a quick introduction to myself and Forward Action, so you know who I am. So Forward Action is a, uh, an agency based in the UK. We specialise in um, digital movement building with charities and uh, progressive campaigns. Uh, Forward Action was founded out of the UK Labour Party's general election campaign of 2015. Um, my co-founder Joe and I worked in the Labour Party's digital team um, and our <coughs> team's brief was to take a digital programme that had been understaffed and under-resourced under and to apply the digital movement building techniques used so effectively by uh, people like the Obama campaign uh, and to use those techniques to build a digital fundraising and volunteer recruitment program. In around 18 months, our team grew Labour's email list by 1.7 million people. Uh, we raised 3.1 million pounds online, which was a record for an uh, election in Europe at that time. And we got around 100,000 people signed up to volunteer. Um, <clears throat> And both Joe and I had worked in the NGO sector before going to Labour uh, and we felt very strongly that the movement building techniques that had been so effective at Labour uh, would also work well in the charity sector but, but weren't being used. So that's what we set Forward Action up to do. We work with our clients to build movements online. Um, we do that by specialising in driving people to take action, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, we use a testing and data-led approach to our work. Um, so that everything is iterative uh, and all our decision making is based on data rather than gut intuition. And finally, we only work with progressive causes. So that's us, that's me. Um, so movements. So what do we mean when we talk about movement? Um, it's a word that gets used a lot without a lot of clarity. So this is my attempt at a definition. So <clears throat> a movement is people organized around a common narrative to achieve a common goal. So let's look at those three key features one by one. So firstly, um, every movement has typically a, a common goal, um, which is something that the movement's trying to change usually. So whether that's a policy or a law, a behavior change in society or changing a set of attitudes. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, successful movements always have a powerful story that binds together everyone who's in the movement and, and brings people into the movement. And, and this story is what can take the kind of disparate part of the parts of the movement and pull and bring them together and pull in the same direction to achieve that common goal. And I'll come back to that story in a little bit. <laughs> Finally, movements need to be organized at some level in order to harness the power of the people who are involved in the movement. This can either be very grassroots and bottom up um, think Black Lives Matter or Me Too, for example or it can be organized more centrally through a body like a political party or a charity. Um, so as campaigners and, and, and particularly as fundraisers, thinking about how we can build movements to, to try and achieve our, our organization's goals and to, to fundraise with, um, <clears throat> we're primarily thinking here about that second of centralized kind of movement organization, uh, at least initially. There, there are some extremely successful grassroots movements that have been started by charities um, initially, so the best example of this in recent years in the UK um, is probably the movement to end plastic pollution, which was started and led initially by environmental groups, but has now grown to have a life of its own with millions of people picking it up and doing their own thing to drive a movement forward outside of the kind of centre of coordination. So who is doing this well? Who's using movement building well to, to fundraise online? So the, the, probably the number one go-to example of this model being used effectively is uh, Bernie Sanders' presidential election uh, campaign in 2016. So here are the numbers from, from Bernie's campaign. So they grew an email list uh, of over 10 million people. And from those supporters, they raised $218 million online from 2.8 million donors <coughs> and 8.5 million Con, uh, individual contributions uh, with an average contribution of $27. So this is probably this is the probably the single most effective example of fundraising with a digital movement. 94% of these donations came online, 
So Bernie's campaign was effectively almost entirely funded by small donations given online. Um, Bernie's obviously running again for the 2020 election, uh, and we're seeing a similar pattern from uh, his campaign so far. And again, in his first six weeks, he had around a million individual donors who raised $15 million in total. And what we're seeing is that um, <clears throat> in the Democratic primary, for the first time really, small dollar online donations, uh, fundraising, is the number one way that candidates are looking to raise money for their campaigns. And they're prioritizing this over traditional high value um, fundraising events or through taking money from super PACs. Um, and that in, that's a really good thing for, for democracy. It means that campaigns are more beholden to the wishes of the people who vote for them than they are to a few people with a lot of money who can, who can fund their campaign. But that's been a really interesting trend. Um, in the UK, the Labour Party are, are taking a very uh, similar approach to, um, <clears throat> to Bernie Sanders uh, and the Corbyn iteration of the Labour Party is built on um, what we did in 2015 and, and really made a success of their digital fundraising programme. We had another election in the UK in 2017 and over the, the space of just seven weeks the Labour Party raised around four million pounds online uh, which was more than we raised in 18 months in 2015. Uh, and is the equivalent to over a quarter of the Labour Party's entire election campaign. So it's a really significant um, piece of their fundraising effort. Um, outside of the political sector, in the charity sector, Greenpeace are, are real trailblazers for a, for a digital movement building model. In the UK, they've been leading on this for, for around a decade. And as a result, um, they have one of the largest email lists in Europe. They raise tens of millions of pounds a year through online fundraising and in fact the proportion of their overall new donations that are coming online um, has recently gone above 50%. So again, online fundraising is a substantial part of their, their, fundraising, um, their fundraising department. And just to show that you don't need to be a big political party or a large charity with a lot of brand recognition to do this. Um, Reprieve is, is an organization, another organization who do this exceptionally well. They're a very small organization who campaign and represent people on death row and campaign against torture. Their digital fundraising team is just two people, but they um, punch well above their weight in terms of how much money they raise online. Uh, they've built a, a, a very engaged email list of tens of thousands of people that they mobilize very effectively. So I'd really recommend um, anyone goes up to goes and signs up to Reprieve's email list for a really good example of, of the approaches I'm going to be talking about in this presentation put into practice. Okay, so those are the examples of who is doing this well. How do you go about doing this uh, well for yourself? Um, <clears throat> so there are four key uh, overarching elements of this that I'm going to talk through one after the other. So the first thing to do is, is we need to set our movement philosophy. So this is a kind of broad strategic framework, essentially. This defines what your movement is for, how it's going to be structured, how it's going to communicate with the supporters, and essentially what its, its story is. Um, so you can and you definitely should be testing and refining this philosophy over time and your story over time. But it's good to have a sense of this when you start out at the beginning because it will shape the language you use to describe and bring people into the movement right from the start, and it will shape how you talk to your earliest and most important supporters. So it's good to have a sense of this right from the beginning. So the first uh, part of defining your movement philosophy is your movement story. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the three key pillars of building um, a digital movement. And a good uh, movement story is essential because it performs a number of functions. It brings people into your movement. It's what attracts them and says, yes, this is for me and I'm gonna sign up and I wanna be part of this. It's the kind of narrative that keeps people engaged long term and continuing to take actions that will help hit your goal and continue to give money to help fund your, your mission. Um, and it's what binds together all the different parts of the movement and what it does. So a good movement story has four key elements broadly. There's a really excellent book um, called The Political Brain by Drew Weston, which uh, talks more in more detail about what makes a good persuasive political story. Um, and also talks about the kind of neuroscience that backs it up, and it's, it's really interesting. 
Um, <clears throat> so I'd recommend reading that if you want more information on, on how to construct an effective uh, movement story. But these four key elements that I, I tend to uh, draw out are, firstly, you need to describe what the problem you're trying to solve is. Um, secondly, what your solution to that problem is. Thirdly, how you bridge the problem and solution, how you're going to get there. And fourthly, who or what stands in your way? Who, who are the kind of villains of your story, essentially? So to, to give an example of this in, in practice, um, with, with Bernie Sanders' movement story, um, you can tell a movement when a movement story is, is strong and, and effective because it's often simple. It needs to be easy to explain, it needs to be easy to understand, and it needs to be emotive. And Bernie's is a really good example of this. So in Bernie's movement story, the problem <clears throat> is that the US economy is rigged against ordinary people in favour of wealthy corporations and in favour of kind of established or powerful elites. The solution is we need to elect Bernie because Bernie is on the side of those people and Bernie as president will be able to put in place laws that would redistribute um, power and wealth to ordinary people in society and take it away from the kind of privileged few. <clears throat> The way to get there, the way to get Bernie elected is to campaign. You've got to go out and give money, you've got to knock on doors, you've got to talk to friends. But crucially, um, you need to be a lot of people working together to do that because standing in our way is corporations, it's the powerful established elites. They have a lot of money and they have a lot of power and the only way we're going to beat them is by a lot of people working together and campaigning together to get Bernie elected. So it's, it's, that's a kind of very coherent, easy to understand, uh, emotive movement story and that's partly why Bernie's movement has been so effective because everything he does is underpinned by that story. <clears throat> so beyond your movement story you then have to define what is your organization's theory of change? How is it that you are going to achieve your goal? How, you, how do you think about how that change happens? Where is the power in your movement essentially? Um, and this shapes in a really fundamental way, how a movement goes around, <clears throat> goes about communicating with its supporters. <clears throat> so there are two, <clears throat> excuse me, there are two different kinds of model here that I'm going to outline. <clears throat> so the first is a horizontal model, which is which is what's used more typically by movements and is, um, as our come on to, is the most effective model for digital movement building. Um, <clears throat> The second is vertical, which is a more traditional kind of way that charities might speak to their supporters. So let's start with the vertical model. So here's a kind of summary of a typical theory of change in a, in a vertical model of speaking to supporters. <clears throat> so it goes, we, the organization, are going to solve this problem. Give us money to help us do it. So what this does is it creates a kind of vertical hierarchy. It's the organization who's the hero. The organization has the power to solve this problem. It knows how to solve this problem. It's going to do it on its own. It just needs you to give them the kind of money and resources so that it can do that. And what this immediately does is creates a distance between the organization and the supporter. As a supporter, um, <clears throat> you don't feel like you have a direct stake in what the organization does. You either have a choice to support them with your money or you have a choice to not support them. It also... Um, removes, uh, it also means that your impact as a supporter can only ever be secondary. You can't have a direct impact on the goal that you want to achieve yourself. The only way you can have impact is by giving money to an organisation so that they can have impact on your behalf. So it's quite disempowering in that regard, which makes it less motivating. <clears throat> a horizontal model treats us very differently. So here is a summary of the theory, theory of change in a, in a horizontal model. So We can only solve this problem with lots of us working together, and here's how you can have impact. So what this does straight away is firstly, it centers the supporter within this narrative. It's about how you can have impact directly on, on um, the goals that you want to achieve, not just how you can facilitate us, the organization, to do it. You're having this impact yourself. It also emphasizes this idea of collaboration, of being part of something bigger in yourself, of this only being possible it, <clears throat> lots of people work together. So at the same time, it gives you both a sense of being part of something important and big, but also a sense of responsibility that we all need to do our part of this. And so part of you doing your part in a fundraising context is, is giving money to, to support the movement. It also breaks down that the, 
the distinction between the organization and the supporter. It puts everyone on the same kind of level, everyone is working together, um, and everyone has the same kind of stake in the movement. And that helps supporters feel like they have real, a real kind of say and a real um, ownership over the movement and what it's doing. <clears throat> um, and most movements that fundraise online use this kind of messaging. And whenever we've tested it in our work, this kind of approach has been much more effective for driving people to donate and crucially for keeping them engaged and motivated by the movement long term than a more vertical model, which, which tends to can drive some donations, but also tends to lead people to disengage over time because they don't really develop that kind of emotional bond with the movement and the organization that they can with the horizontal model. <clears throat> so here's an example of this uh, put into practice in a fundraising email. So this is an email from an organization uh, called Global Justice Now, Forward Action Works with. Um, and this sets out, uh, as ahead of a fundraising ask, this is the kind of core horizontal movement building narrative that they're setting out. So, uh, Global Justice Now, I should say, campaign against, uh, uh, amongst other things, against corruption and, and kind of irresponsible companies. So, email goes, <clears throat> Taking on some of the world's wealthiest and most powerful institutions isn't an easy task. We can't compete with their resources, but we can work smarter and with integrity. And when lots of us act together, it adds up. Global Justice Now's members are people of all ages, from all walks of life. What we have in common is our values, a passion for making the world a fairer place. Your generosity is, allow is what allows our movement to plan out and win effective campaigns to challenge corporate greed. So I've highlighted in pink here the, the phrases that particularly drive that idea of working together, of cooperation, of everyone having a kind of equal stake in this movement. Uh, and also that you as a supporter have the ability to create direct impact. Okay, so now we've defined our movement story and our movement philosophy. Uh, we need to start growing, going about growing our movement. Uh, and the starting point for um, for growing our movement should, or in, in most scenarios for a fundraising goal, should be growing your email list and doing that through low barrier entry points. So firstly, why, why email? So when it comes to digital fundraising and also digital campaigning, email is, is still king. It's still by far the most effective digital channel for repeatedly mobilizing people. Um, so, for example, we typically see, if you look at income online, leaving to one side, income from organic visits to the website, to the website, with our clients, typically around 80 to 95% of online donations will come from email, whereas maybe just 3, three 4, 5% will come from social media. Um, so email is a, is a substantially the biggest driver of online, online donations. Um, <clears throat> So for an online movement to be effective for fundraising, we typically need to find ways to, uh, to find potential supporters who will share our values and be willing to support the movement and get them signed up cost effectively, which is where low barrier entry points come in. Um, so low barrier entry points are essentially a way for supporters to sign up that's easy, quick to do, but doesn't, uh, isn't asking to take a very difficult action uh, and serves as a good way of kind of introducing people into the movement to collecting their email address so that you can then go back to them with, with follow-up communications and follow-up asks. So petitions are still of a go-to low barrier entry point uh, and they still work well, um, but most organizations also need other options, whether that's because they don't run any campaigns that are suitable for petitions, or they've maxed out what they can do with petitions and they need another route to grow. Um, so there's a couple of uh, tactics uh, that we found particularly successful that I want to go through. These aren't necessarily the only other ways to grow your email list, but they are tactics that we found particularly successful in a wide range of contexts. So the first is hand raisers. So hand raisers differ from a petition in that they have no specific target or sometimes no specific policy. Instead, what they do is uh, provide a value statement or a belief or perhaps a policy that people can kind of add their name to say, yes, I agree with this. So they look similar to a petition, but they, they have some kind of crucial differences. So here's an example that we, we've created um, for Dignity and Die, who are a, a UK campaign group who 
campaign to legalise assisted dying. Um, so this hand raise is framed as an official record of support. So it's for people who think that uh, assisted dying should be legal. Um, they can add their name to, to this kind of official record of support. It gives people a way to kind of stick their flag in the ground and express their values and their beliefs and create a kind of record that, for posterity that will say, you know, this is what I believe, that I was on the right side of history on this issue. Um, this has been extremely successful for Dignity and Dying. Um, it's been running about seven, eight, seven or eight months and we've recruited uh, 80,000 new supporters for our email list um, at a cost per new subscriber of around 37 pence, which is, is, is very low. Um, it's, here's an example from uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign in 2016. So Michael Whitney, who was uh, Bernie's online fundraising manager in 2016 and ran his digital, um, digital fundraising program, is on Ford Action's advisory group. And he told us that the single most effective um, tactic they found for getting people to sign up was these kind of values he hand raises like this. And this was in fact the one that performed best overall. So this single value statement, nobody who works 40 hours a week should be living in poverty. Poverty, enter your email address, enter your zip code. I agree. They put this up on their website for anyone who visited. This was the first thing they see. <coughs> this, all, and this was extremely effective for growing their email list. Okay, so that's, that's hand raises, um, and we find that hand raises are particularly effective for bringing in your kind of core supporters early on. So they're the people who agree with your values, who would definitely be on, on board. All you need to do is reach them and give them that kind of low barrier doorway where they're like, yeah, I agree with that, I'm walking through that, I'm on your email list. Um, <clears throat> a second kind of tactic that we found more effective for once you have a bigger list for reaching new audiences who haven't perhaps engaged with your kind of issue-led content with petitions or hand raises are what we call engagement tools. So these are our, our fun, interactive um, online experiences that don't lead with the issue, but then introduce uh, the issue in a sign-up ask um, while the users are, are kind of interacting with the tool. So one example of this is, is quizzes. Um, so here's an example of a quiz that we, we've developed with uh, the One Campaign, who are a campaign group who campaign uh, against uh, poverty um, and inequality. And they were running a campaign uh, around access to education for girls around the world. Um, and this, we created this quiz, the content of which is very simple. Um, you're shown a map of Africa <coughs> um, and you're shown one of the other nine different countries highlighted. And you have a choice of three and you have to guess which country you're looking at basically. And once people have done that, before they got their result and find out how many they got right, um, we landed people on this slide, which links them, which created the link into the issue, which was that these nine countries they've just seen are the places where in the world where it's hardest for, for girls to get an education. And that then asked, and with that, that kind of hook, asked them to then sign a petition. Um, this quiz in particular was, was extremely successful for the one campaign. They, in the end, through viral sharing, had about 2.5 million users, and they grew their email list by 500,000 people. Not every quiz, of course, uh, has that kind of success, but it's a model that we found really effective for a range of different organizations in a range of different contexts. Other kind of engagement tools um, include information apps, which are basically a website where you can go in, maybe enter a little bit of information about yourself, like, for example, what your, your, your um, commute route is, is one we've done in London. And then you'll get back a kind of personalized insight, like how many people are on exactly the same commute, commute as you, which is in that London context. Um, so the, these kind of tools work around giving people an enjoyable experience, maybe giving them a little bit of insight about themselves, which makes it engaging and interesting, but also making sure that it's relevant enough that you can hook in the campaign and get people to sign up um, in that way. So it's not just enough to create these low barrier entry points and hope that people find them or sign up, you need to actively promote them. Uh, and that's where Facebook ads come in. So Facebook ads are, um, we found, and, and I think most organizations have found, by far the most reliable and cost effective way to drive uh, traffic at scale to your low barrier entry points and to get people to sign up cost effectively. Um, <clears throat> But your goal should always be to use Facebook ads to get people off Facebook and onto your email list. And that is a crucial point. 
you should never focus on using Facebook ads to grow your audience within Facebook page, so to, to grow likers on your Facebook page, for example. And the reason for that is that Facebook throttles your ability to communicate with your supporters who like your page. So only around 8% of your Facebook fans uh, will be shown any of your posts. And the more you post, the more that percentage will go down because Facebook penalizes pages that post too much content. Um, whereas if you get people onto email, you can go back to them time and time again with repeat asks. You can target different people with different communications depending on what they've done in the past. And you own or are in control of that data. You're not subject to the whims of what Facebook does with its algorithm or its, its use policy. So that's a kind of key takeaway point. You should always be focused on growing your email list rather than growing your Facebook audience. <coughs> Okay, ask early, ask often. So now we've grown, we've started growing our movement, we've grown our email list. As fundraisers, we need to turn our attention to um, how we can drive people to start giving money to fund the movement and to fund your mission. Um, so typically, organizations make an, uh, follow an approach and make an assumption that once people have signed up to hear from your organization, you need to wait and build a relationship with them before you can start asking them for money and the rationale goes that if someone signs up and then you immediately ask them for money that's kind of it's it's too abrupt and you might destroy the relationship and you'll, you'll never get a donation from them ever all the data that we've ever seen from our work from our, our, our labor party our work on fraud action of our clients shows that in fact the exact opposite is the case when it comes to a digital fundraising concept so the point at which most people are willing to give a donation is really early on. In fact, the data shows that the earlier, earlier you can ask people broadly, the more likely they are to become a donor in the long term. Um, so that work of getting people to become a donor starts right at the point of, of they've signed up. Um, and that's where post sign up, donate us come in. So that's essentially, um, <clears throat> The idea that is straight after someone has taken a sign-up action, that you should be immediately then bouncing them onto a donation loss. And if you think about why that's effective, um, signing up to an email list is an action that demonstrates someone is kind of warmed up and motivated in that moment. They've seen something, whether it's a Facebook ad or a share, an email, that they've that's got them to click. They've read your petition text or your hand raiser text and thought, yes, I agree with this and they agree with it enough and they're motivated enough to do something about it that they've chosen to enter their data. So it's a point where they're kind of highly engaged. And what you find is that if you ask people to do more stuff at that point, a lot of people are willing to do that. So that's where post sign up donate asks come in. So here's an example of a kind of a simple structure based on this. This is a page that we built for Greenpeace and it chains together a series of actions after people sign up. So first you sign up, then there's a share ask, which you can skip if you don't want to share, and then you're immediately sent down to a donation, a donation ask. Um, and we found that by putting these asks together one after the other on the page, um, <clears throat> that you get a much higher percentage of people taking that post sign up donate action than if you kind of bounce people off to a separate thank you page. And the reason for that is twofold. One, having this scrolling, um, the scrolling kind of action chain doesn't break up the user experience and sort of implies to people, okay, there's more to do. You've done the first thing, but look, we're scrolling on to the next thing. And secondly, it means people don't have to contend with extra page loads times, where particularly on mobile, if you've signed a petition, then you have to wait a few seconds to get to the thank you page. And a lot of people kind of drop off at that point, and this structure minimizes that. Um, and in fact, you don't need to stop at that asking people for that first donation at that point. So to kind of illustrate this principle of always ask people to do the next thing because when they're doing something they're engaged and if you can give them a good reason they're going to be willing to do something else. This is an example of a, a thank you page and that we developed with some of us for an organization campaign against corporate abuse around the world <clears throat> um, and this is the page that people see when they make a one-off donation to some of us and it basically says thanks very much for donating you're great um, I know you've just made a one-off donation, but actually, could you now make a, one a monthly donation? 
and we've consistently found with some of us and with other organizations we've tested this with that around four to five percent of people who land on this page straight after making a one-off donation <coughs> will set up a monthly donation through this ask and the reason for that is that if you can give them a, a, a decent rationale for why this this monthly donation is different to the one-off donation they've just made why it's going to have a different and more impact then people are motivated and they're fired up and they're willing to do it um, so this this principle of asking people to give money when they after they've just done something doesn't need to be limited to that point of sign up. It's it's a general principle to apply throughout your your digital program. Whenever you're emailing people, you're giving them an action to take. They should be taking that action and then straight afterwards landing on a follow up action, which from a fundraising perspective can be a donate ask or it could be another higher bar campaigning action if you're working. Um, with the, the campaigning team, um, and that's this is this is one of the examples where digital movement building starts to break down the silos between campaigning and fundraising, because when people when people take a campaigning action, say you've asked them to email a target, that's a really good opportunity because you, people are fired up, they're motivated, they've done something, to then immediately land them on a fundraising ask afterwards, and so the two the two um, goals start to work in harmony. Okay, so that's post-action signups. That's the kind of first core source of um, donations that you're going to be driving online. The second way you're going to be driving most of your donation, your donations for your digital movement building program is through um, email fundraising. So these are our kind of set piece emails that go out to supporters and say, we need to raise money for X, please give us money. Uh, I'm going to talk through a couple of principles of how you go about doing email fundraising well give an example so the principle number one <clears throat> is this you can send much much more fundraising email than you think you can so organizations are often reluctant to send a lot of fundraising email because they think it damages their relationship with supporters that supporters don't like to receive it um, and that because fundraising emails can get a slightly higher unsubscribe rate and it's true, and I'll come back to this in a minute, that if all you send your supporters is lots and lots of fundraising emails, it will in time damage your relationship and you'll disengage. But in fact, um, all the data that we've seen from our work suggests that you can send, that supporters have a much higher tolerance for fundraising emails uh, than, than people typically think. We recommend that, uh, for example, our clients send uh, one fundraising campaign a month and that campaign will contain three to four emails. So supporters might be being sent 36 to 48 emails a year, which sounds like a lot, but it's important to remember that the vast majority of supporters won't be seeing, won't be seeing or opening the vast majority of those emails. You know what the inbox is like, there's a lot of other stuff going on, there's a lot of competition. Most people won't see most of these emails. So in reality, supporters might in fact only open and engage with less than 10 a year. And, and so giving people those repeat opportunities to donate is really essential to raising a good amount of money online because that first email they read might not get them or they might be reading at a bad moment and just forget to donate and so that repeat opportunity is really essential. Um, so to give an example of this in this principle in practice, um, when we started working with, with Greenpeace UK on their email fundraising a few years ago, they were just sending four campaigns a year of, of, of three emails uh, and we worked with them to um, triple that to 12 campaigns a year. And as a result, the, the income they were receiving from email fundraising actually quadrupled. It went up four times over. So volume is essential. I think that's the number one takeaway of, of this section. Um, <clears throat> so when you're actually writing your emails and, and planning the strategy and the content of them, how do you go about writing email that is going to convert, is going to be effective and persuasive? So there are five key principles to, to highlight. So the first is that your aim should be to motivate people uh, to donate and not to try and persuade them. So the reason for this is that um, if you, you uh, so you, it's pretty safe to make the assumption that on the whole, most people on your list already agree with you. That's because people don't typically seek out things that they disagree with. You know, you won't seek out a petition or a, a hand raiser that you disagree with and sign up to. You're typically seeking out stuff that you agree with, and so you end up on an email list and with people people on your email list will typically already agree with you. For those who don't, it's very unlikely that in the space of an email you're going to be able to take someone from either completely indifferent or actively hostile to your issue 
and be so persuasive that you can get them into a space where they're taking a high bar action like donation. It's just, it's not really feasible. So your focus needs to be on taking those people who already persuaded, you don't need to persuade them that you're right, they already believe that you're right, they already agree with you. And what you need to do instead is motivate them to give, you need to tell them why they should be giving money. And so the way to do that are first, you need a compelling narrative. Um, it's emotion and values that, um, that fire people up and drive people to take action rather than kind of logic and statistics and story and stories are the best way to kind of communicate or a compelling story rather is the best way to communicate those that kind of emot that emotion. Secondly, you need to communicate a tangible impact. You need to give people a theory of change and explain how it is that giving money is going to impact on the goals that they, they want to see. And the more you can make that impact direct, so the more that someone thinks, I'm giving this money and I can really tangibly see what it's going to achieve myself, my money, the better. Uh, within reason, if you go too far over and start giving people, asking people to give money to fund paper, paper clips, that's kind of boring and it kills a narrative. It needs to still be motive, but tangibility is crucial. Finally, uh, thirdly, so participating in something bigger, the idea of social proof that you're one of lots of people doing this can be really motivating. And finally, um, urgency and timeliness. Whenever we tested this, people understanding why you need a donation from them right now, not in a month, like why it's important they give right now is a really effective, uh, important driver for, for um, people giving. So I'm just gonna uh, go through um, a, an example of a, a couple of emails um, from Greenpeace New Zealand, which, which put these principles into practice really, really well, and also are an excellent example of how to put that horizontal model of communication with supporters into practice. Um, so I'm gonna read, read it through. Uh, we need a bigger boat and we need your help to get it. The oil industry is threatening our very survival. Right now, Statoil and Chevron are searching off the Wairarapa coast for more climate wrecking oil with their seismic blasting ship, Amazon Moria, AKA the beast. So there you're already bringing in this kind of very vivid narrative of these kind of big oil companies out there blasting off this beautiful coast with a ship that is literally called the beast. Um, the oil industry is pushing us further into a climate crisis, threatening almost everything we know and love. We've been out to confront them once already in our inflatable boats. I delivered a cease and desist message on your behalf. So again, that's kind of bringing the supporter into it. It wasn't, you know, I delivered my cease and desist message. It was a message on your behalf. That was acting on your behalf as a representative of the, of the movement. We stayed for as long as we could, but had to come back to shore before night closed in and the weather turned bad. A little inflatables just couldn't handle it. That's why we need your help to buy a bigger boat. Can you help get us back out to confront the beast? So here, there's a really vivid narrative. You can kind of see them going out in their, in their little ships and confronting this massive ship called the beast and just not being able to handle it. And you understand that's okay. Yeah, you need a bigger boat. It's simple, it's easy to understand. It's tangible, you know your money's gonna to go towards a bigger boat. So that's email one. This is the second email they sent. We found a boat, but we don't quite have enough uh, to buy it. We urgently need your help. And they've got here a, a picture of the actual boat. They, this is like peak tangibility. They've gone out, they've found a boat, they need it, but they, they, they've got a picture so you can see it. It's got, you can even see the for sale sign, but they just don't quite have enough money to, to buy it. Um, so we've been scouring the country looking for a boat that will allow us to get back, back out to sea to confront the Amazon warrior, AKA the beast, which is again referring you back to the, the narrative, reminding you of the story, bringing in that kind of beast name again, which is very evocative. As it blasts our ocean floor, searching for more climate wrecking oil. And we've just found one, here it is. And this is the second half of the email. But we need a little bit more uh, to get us over the line to buy this boat. This boat would be our boat, yours and mine. It would be the people's boat. And then it goes on. So here, again, you can really understand, uh, clearly understand tangibility of your donation like where is your money going to you understand the urgency perfectly like it's very clear why they need the money now not in three months time and they're bringing in this really nice sense of being part of something bigger than yourself you're not buying this grub boat that Greenpeace New Zealand is going to own and kind of keep you're buying a boat that's shared between you and New Zealand and it's the people's boat it's everyone you're part of this kind of lovely bigger thing which is really nice 
So this, this is a really effective example of putting all these principles into practice and using that horizontal model of communication well. Okay, final principle, keep giving people valuable things to do. So movement building, particularly for fundraising, uh, requires a completely different mindset around timescales to traditional fundraising. So typically a telephone fundraising funnel might last from uh, might last around three months from the point of getting a phone number to the point at which either that supporter has made a donation or you've given up calling on them. In email fundraising, whilst a lot of people are still most likely to donate to you soon after they've signed up to your list, as, as I was saying earlier, some people might not make their first donation for two or three years. Um, so it's really important to uh, keep people um, engaged and open your emails longer term so that you're continuing to give people opportunities to make donations, which they may be willing to do, um, even if they've not made one early on. Even more importantly than that, you need to keep those people who did make a donation early on engaged and open your email so that you've got the opportunity to, to ask them to make repeat donations. And re retention um, and getting repeat donations is typically as much as 50% of the income that you'll see from a digital fundraising program, so that's crucial. <clears throat> and we found in all our work and all the kind of data we've seen that the most effective way to keep people engaged and open your emails long term is to keep giving them interesting things to do that feel valuable and impactful. So if you think our, our unique selling point as a sector is that we alone, not alone, but you know, we, we are uncommon and relatively unique in that we can give people stuff to do that directly empowers them to make change and make change in the world and put their values into action. And so that's the way that we keep people engaged long term. It's not just through giving them lots of passive content. Um, stories and video has a really important part to play in the, in, um, in the storytelling of a digital movement building program. But if all we're doing is giving people passive stuff to consume and sending people newsletters, then we're competing with content creators like Netflix and YouTube and newspapers for attention. And ultimately that's a fight we're not gonna win. Um, so here's an example of, of um, the kind of fruits of, of, of doing this well. So Greenpeace, again, are extremely effective at giving people lots of valuable, interesting actions to do um, that keep people engaged over the long term, whether that's signing petitions, writing to decision makers, and so on. Uh, and so this is kind of borne out in a fundraising campaign we ran a couple of years ago using that template I showed you earlier. Uh, and this campaign was really effective for driving people to make their first donation. So we pulled the length of time people had been on Greenpeace's email list before making this first donation through this campaign. And what we found is that over 82% of our donors had been on the email list for three months, so longer than that kind of telephone fundraising threshold. And in fact, 17% had been on the email list for a full three years or longer before making this first donation. And the reason they were still there and able to make this first donation is that Greenpeace is really effective at giving people interesting stuff to do that makes you feel like you, you there's a purpose to your open emails that feels like you're impactful uh, and keeps people opening and engaged long term. <clears throat> okay, so finally to finish up with, the kind of subtitle of this presentation was the antidote to GDPR. Uh, and I just want to talk through why, you know, what I mean by that. Um, so for those not based in Europe, GDPR is a new set of data protection legislation that uh, one of the key features of which is that people have to actively consent if they want to hear from you via email or phone or any kind of direct marketing channel. Um, and GDPR is, is already fundamentally disrupting traditional fundraising models. Um, it's already, and will increasingly become difficult to get people's data and consent for calling and direct mail. So we're now in an era where people need to want to hear from us before we can contact them, essentially. And that's a really good thing, but it, it presents a challenge for typical uh, traditional fundraising models. Um, it also means that maintaining a relationship with supporters who do sign up um, so that you can continue to ask them to donate and to support your mission is even more important than before because that data is harder to get. So a movement building model is, is particularly well suited to respond to this challenge. Um, it's, that's because it leads with emotion and values and a compelling story, all of which are designed to bring people to you and to actively make excite people and make them want to be part of your movement. And it's effective because it's well suited because it also uses a horizontal model which puts supporters and their impact right at the heart of the story, which is designed to keep people engaged long term, which, which helps make sure that you're getting most value out of your, your relationship with supporter and out of the data you've acquired. Um, 
And finally, we're seeing from a digital perspective, we're seeing that people are choosing to hear from us via digital channels over offline ones. So on a, we found in our work that once an organization has optimized their opt-in language and their, their, the technology they're using, we typically see an opt-in rate of 50 to 75% for email, which is really high. Whereas opt-in rate for phone and direct mail is, is kind of a fraction of that. So that's a kind of very quick run through to a, quite a big topic. But those, I think, are the core reasons why uh, a digital movement building model is, is particularly uh, suited for fundraising in uh, the context of GDPR and a similar kind of data legislation that's likely to be coming in, in in the US soon, and why we see this very much as the fundraising model of the, of the future. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much. Um, if you have any questions, my email, list, uh, email address sorry, was at the start of the uh, presentation, or you can contact, through, contact me through our website. Um, I will be answering questions in the comments underneath the presentation, and uh, please fill in the session evaluation form, I've been asked to say. All right, thanks so much for listening, and have a great day.